Hi, Sue. How are you today? I am doing great, Nancy, and looking forward to another conversation. I look forward to these as well. I mean, um, you know, the, the title of your sermon last Sunday was, you know, start, start living the life you want. And don't we all kind of want to know how to, how to do that? So I've got a few questions for you, as, as you know. Yeah, I do know. I'm looking forward to them. <laughs> So I just want to start at the end of your sermon. You had um, this passage um, from that Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heaven, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke will lift, fit you well, and my load will make you come alive. So I just think that's beautiful. And does this message from Jesus kind of invite us to focus first and foremost on kind of our inner peace? I think, and then kind of go from there? I, I, I think it does uh, because everything has to start with us. I mean, it goes back to that whole idea that if you want to change the world, you have to start with changing yourself. If you want your life to be different, you need to be different. If you want people around you to be different, you can't change people around you, but as you change yourself, people respond differently. So yes, I think it really is saying we need to start looking at our own inner peace and then see where that goes in the rest of our lives. But but it's, it starts with us. If, mm -hmm. if we are chaotic inside, um, if we are tired, if we are exhausted and we don't do anything different, then we're going to continue to be chaotic, tired, and exhausted mm -hmm. no matter what else is happening around us. Mm -hmm. And that kind of links to the message you had at the lunch service last week too around our, our busyness, but this shift, right, that we're invited to make is how does making this shift of kind of being busy, right, um, and, and to shifting to cultivating kind of internal peace within, how does that help us pay the rent, buy the groceries, take care of the kids, take care of our grandparents? It might not be the answer people want to hear, but it may not help us exactly in those ways. It may change our outlook in how we go about those things, uh, which will change again others' experience. I mean, think about think about taking care of your your kids um, or your parents. Uh, you know, for those of us in the sandwich generation, you you got both both going on there. If you are squeezing in care for your parents or your kids in the midst of an already busy life and things aren't going just perfect with your parents or your kids, you might have a tendency to get short with them, which might have a tendency to have a negative impact on your relationship. If you are finding ways to be at peace inside yourself, if you're finding ways to find uh, better integration in your life, then that's going to, uh, it's, it's going to result in a more calm and peaceful interaction with those around you, which is going to make your relationships better, which is going to make it easier to care for your kids or your parents, and they're going to respond in a more positive way. Uh, so you know, is it going to help you put food on the table? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but is it going to help you approach your work better in a more healthy way, which might, who knows, might lead to a promotion. It might lead to being aware of other opportunities around you that really fit your passions and you go that way. So it's really hard to know what the long-term consequences of, of really focusing on yourself are. But if you want a better life, you got to focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So, you you described that the yoke was it was really a it's a it's a device mm -hmm. right that um uh are were put on ox right yeah. to to carry the load so so let's just think about you know we're carrying our burdens 
right? Whatever, whatever they are. Um, I think a lot of us carry our burdens like a badge of, of honor. So, so not so sure why that is, but, but, but why is that? Why do we, why do we like, you know, oh, you listen to somebody's story, right? About their life and you're like, oh, but I got it worse. I've got a heavier burden than you. Wait, why is that? What's, what's going on? You know, again, as I said in our, our last conversation, I don't know entirely, but somehow playing the martyr really <clears throat> is attractive to some people. Um, it gets us, or we hope it gets us either sympathy or honor from others. It, it um, um, makes us the center of attention. I guess. And, and if I'm a bigger martyr than you are, if I'm carrying that bigger burden than you are, well, then I become the center of attention and not you. Mm. Now, whether we're consciously uh, making that choice to, to be the bigger martyr, I, I don't think we consciously make that choice. Um, but I think for some people, that's kind of the only way they know how to get recognition and attention. Uh, I remember, it's, it's funny, it goes all the way back to elementary school. I remember this kid in school who was always seemed to have something medically wrong with him. Uh, and it could be as simple as, oh, I scraped my finger during recess or something like that. And so he would get the teacher's attention. And I, looking back, I wonder if, if this kid didn't get a lot of caring attention at home. And so becoming the, oh, poor me, look at me kid at school got him carrying attention. And I wonder how much of that happens unconsciously for us. That, um, because everybody else around us is as busy as we are and hectic and chaotic and stressed out. And, you know, they don't always have the capacity maybe to give each of us what we need in terms of that that just gentle carrying and lifting up. And so, you know, again, I'm totally theorizing, but I wonder if, if that's some of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the other piece that's going on is, uh, again, we've talked about this, our need to justify ourselves to others. Yeah, I'm, I'm worth the salary I'm getting paid because look at how hard I work. Or I was rude to you because I'm so stressed out and busy. Yes. Yes. Could be the excuse. Could be the excuse of not behaving in a loving and kind way. Yeah. I, I really don't think our, our martyrdom or our busyness that we, we hold up as a badge of honor is, is done with any ill intent towards anybody. I, I think it's probably meeting trying to meet a need inside ourselves that we may not even be able to articulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So um, in your message, you know, um, you're kind of inviting us to kind of, to, to really identify what brings us joy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But how do, how do we know when we're carrying somebody else's burden? Right. When it's, when we're carrying something mm -hmm. that is not ours to carry. I think one way we know that is when other people withdraw from participating. Mm. Why participate if there's nothing for me to do? I was a, an interim pastor at another church. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with an interim pastor, we go in between settled pastors. So a pastor might have been in a church for a good number of years and that pastor's left the church's ready to look for a new pastor, but they need someone to come in and just kind of help them grieve that loss, help them deal with issues that may be coming up. So they're in a good place, healthy place for the next pastor coming in. So I did that for a, a number of years. And one of the churches I served, there was a pastor who'd been there for about 17, 18 years. Uh, and when I got there, I found people just clamoring to do things. And what I realized um, and I talked to this pastor also and, and heard the same thing from him was that he never let people do anything mm -hmm. out of love. 
Mm. Because he said, they are so busy. They have all this other stuff they need to do. They shouldn't have to worry about doing that stuff at church. So I will do it for them. When I got there, I had people who said, we want to do things. We want to be involved. We want to contribute. Um, but out of love, the other pastor, uh, just he didn't recognize that and, and mm. tried to be helpful. He, he did their work for them. So I think when we find people saying, I want to do something, but there's nothing for me to do, and they withdraw, we're, we got a really good clue that we may be carrying somebody else's burden. We may mm. be doing more than, than is healthy for us to do and denying people, other people, the opportunity to make the contribution they want to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's one way that we might get a clue that we're carrying somebody else's burden. Uh, but another one is if we are getting burned out. Oftentimes it's because we're carrying our own burden and one, two, three, or four other people's burdens. And so if we're getting burned out, I think that's one of the first questions to ask is, am I, am I carrying somebody else's load in addition to mine? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it may be, am I carrying their load instead of the one that I should be no. carrying? You know, no. I've, I've, I honestly can't think of a time where maybe that was me, but I've certainly seen that in others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so pay attention to those clues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just, I would just add, I think, I think what's um, <clears throat> helpful is to, you know, really know what's mine and what's somebody else's. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, you know, I had my, my son in residential rehab and my mother in hospice <laughs> yeah. at the same time mm -hmm. as you know. And really, my job was to just support and love them both. They were both on their own journey. I couldn't do mom's transition for her and I couldn't, you know, do my son's kind of counseling and therapy for him. So it was really interesting to observe that my only role was to love and support them on their journey, not to do anything. Mm -hmm. Now, did I make some phone calls to make sure everybody was in the right place? Yes, I did that. But I think, you know, you've, you've highlighted something that I think we all fall into is that, you know, you recognize what your role was. And, and I think sometimes when we're in those positions, because we care about someone, we want to take on other roles. I want to fix this issue. I want to make sure all this is happening. And it's like, I, I need to be here and I need to be there. And, and we can't. And to, for you to be able to recognize, you know, my role isn't to do these other things, but it's to love them on their journey is a sign of wisdom. Doesn't mean you don't get frustrated about things that may not be going well. Uh, doesn't mean you don't make those phone calls on occasion to make sure things are being done as they should be. Um, but to figure out where that line is, it's like, I, I, can, I can carry this load this far and no farther. Mm -hmm. And then someone else needs to pick it up at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge is, is that if nobody picks it up at that point, are we okay still saying that's not my load to carry? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not because that's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then that goes to, well, it goes back to that self-care. Um, I did some research uh, 10 years ago on in healthcare and, and kind of this notion of how do we transform and heal healthcare? And I interviewed a lot of people and blah, 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 blah. And what it came down to is self-care. Yeah. And, and then you come to find out that the healthcare workers as they're wonderful wonderful but they're the most unhealthy workforce <laughs> on the planet they're actually more unhealthy than truck drivers and sitting is the new smoking so it's this notion that you said it's like if we don't take care of ourselves and sometimes we have to be okay with dropping something and just letting whatever unfolds unfolds yeah and for those of us who like to be in control 
and to control outcomes, that's really, really hard to do. Mm -hmm. But that self-care, you, you can't care for anybody else if you aren't healthy. It's, you know, it's that whole, the imagery we use in the church a lot is, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can't pour out love to others until your own cup is full or you have nothing to pour out. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to practice that and model that to others is a gift to others, but it's a very different way of being in the world that frankly our society doesn't really support other countries support it better than ours do uh than ours does and so how do you know how do we combat that yeah and then and then you you bring bring into the conversation you know asking for help so there is a um i binge watched the new amsterdam series it's now on i think netflix or prime it's, you know, inner city trauma hospital, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And every episode basically highlights a personal issue that somebody on the team is going through. Because guess what? Well, guess what? Healthcare workers are human too. They have stuff, they have lives and things. And then they also highlight like a issue in the healthcare system. I mean, it's just fabulous. The the head medical director, his his line is, how can I help? You know, so a staff member comes with a situation. How can we help? And what's so fun is they quickly get to a really easy solution. You know, but just asking that question, how can I help? And mm -hmm. I found that I've adopted that in 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 my my daily um, practice now. Great. Um, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people mm -hmm. like you throughout the day and like, and so now I'm like, how can I help? Sometimes it's as little, it's as simple as just listen. Thanks for listening. Sometimes yeah. it's like, could you connect me to somebody or some, you know, could, can, can you give me an idea? So yeah. to talk about this, you know, when you're carrying a burden and you need to reach out for help, right? Or you see somebody else carrying a burden. What's this? Why, why is it important, right? Yeah, well, and the thing that came to mind as you were talking about that is sometimes people don't want to ask for help from us because they see how busy we are. And so our very busyness and martyrdom that we talked about earlier actually becomes a barrier to other people connecting with us and us being able to help them because they don't want to impose on us and they see how busy we are. They hear that from us. And the last thing that they want to do is, is put one more stone on that load that we are carrying. So that's another reason really taking care of ourselves and finding um, that, finding our load and recognizing what to put down is so important because it then creates an open door for others to ask for help of us. Mm -hmm. We have to ask for help too. The example I used in my sermon was on my seminary internship. Uh, planning this massive program for the church on top of everything else. And and my wise advisor saying, you know, you can't ask for help. And it, it literally, the thought had never entered my mind. N not even entered my mind that, oh, I can't ask for help. It just never entered my mind. And I think a lot of us live that way. It just doesn't ever occur to us. But we're made to be in community with each other. We're made to support each other. We were never meant, uh, God never created us to be lone individuals and having to do everything on our, by ourselves. Uh, so be a part of the community and invite them to help you. Give It's a joy when someone asks for help and we can actually do something. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, give them that opportunity, but also um don't kill yourself <laughs> mm, yeah because then you're not helping it you can't yeah no so, so that brings up um when i'm in i'm in a couple of different book clubs and and after we get done kind of talking about the work book and kind of catching up on people's lives one of the things we do because there's like six of us in each group we go around and we say what does somebody need and what does somebody have to give? So the first thing is, what does somebody need help with? I, you know, and, and it's just so interesting what, what people need. And then what does somebody have to give? 
the circle always closes. What somebody Ooh. needs is what somebody has to give. It all, we've been doing this for 10 years. The circle always closes. And it's just a good reminder that A, we're not meant to be alone, to your point. Mm -hmm. We all have different gifts and we're meant to give the gifts that yeah. we have, you know, when, when, when that is the need that somebody has. And we can't give the gift if someone doesn't let us know what their need is. And, and I, I really do believe that because oftentimes we'll look at someone and say, oh, they need this and we'll try to help. We don't know because we haven't asked. Mm -hmm. We make assumptions about what people need. But when you actually show that respect to someone to ask them and then truly listen to them, then you can find out what the real need is. Mm -hmm. And that's where you could say, well, this is where my gifts match your need. Or mine may not match, but I know someone else. Exactly. I can make a connection. Yeah, yeah. We, we did that at church the other day. We had someone come in needing help filling, um, someone from Liberia, uh, needing help filling out forms to access her retirement account. And, you know, these systems can be complicated. And it's like, you know, I, I did not have the gift of time to help her, but it's like, I think I know someone who can. Yeah. And so they connected up on the next Sunday after church and this woman got the help that she needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I love that. Yeah. And I think when we deny receiving gifts from others, we're actually denying the other people the opportunity to give the gift. Yes. You know, so so this exchange is really, you know, important. And I think part of it is, is we all need to be needed. And so if we are, you know, one of those lone ranges, we're just going to you know, muscle our way through. We're going to do it all ourselves. I'm going to carry my burden and everybody else's and I'm just going to go. Then we deny another person that opportunity to be needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. So my last question for you is going to get to this idea of, you know, your, your invitation to connect to our aliveness. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to put a add a little pepper into the pot here. Part of your message was, you know, they, you know, take time to recharge, go on vacation, do these things, which is excellent. Right. And recently, I really, I think in the last six months, I learned that vacation is a derivative of vacate. Okay. And that really, really just kind of struck a chord in my heart um, because I'm like, I don't want to vacate my life. So I, I am trying, I'm, I try to co-create every day to be one that is fulfilling and refilling and refueling and, you know, full of passion. Now, not to say I'm not going to plan an adventure or two, <laughs> but your, your invitation to us is to, Yes, take care of ourselves, release, you know, release the burdens, ask for help. But your invitation is also to connect with our aliveness. You know, God gave us the gift of life, right? And that's happening right now, this minute. So how how do we connect with her, our aliveness for life, right? Even in the midst mm -hmm. of challenges, right? Yeah. And what can we expect when we do that? Yeah, it's, you know, again, connecting with, with what makes us come alive really is tied to recognizing what we're carrying that may not be ours to carry. Because the, the more we carry that isn't ours to carry, um, th those things dampen us. They, they exhaust us. They, they're exactly the opposite of what makes us come alive. But when we find that thing that is ours to carry, it's going to connect with our passion. It's going to connect with something that has meaning to us. It may not be easy. In fact, usually the stuff that's important is not. Uh, so, you know, Jesus never said, I'm going to completely take your burdens away. It's like, let's get the right one for you. And 
we worship a God who says, I came that they may have abundant life. And so to have abundant life means we, we got to figure out what's ours to carry and what's not. And then that just, um, that just kind of expands the opportunities for us. Um, I, I use the, the imagery, a little bit of breathing, uh, during the sermon. And first of all, just taking a breath. And I think when we all take that really deep breath and let it out slowly, and we do that a few times, there is this sense of, of space that opens up. And when space opens up, opportunities open up and opportunities for life to grow. Um, uh, think about when you put a plant in a pot, if it becomes root bound in there and there's no room for those roots to grow, the, the plant is going to be, you know, stilted in its growth, but you give it the space it needs to expand and it can thrive. And so that's really, I think what it is to connect with our aliveness is to, 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 to figure out what we need to do to get that space to breathe. So what do we need to let go of? Mm -hmm. And if we aren't carrying our own, pulling our own load, then, then what is that load? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I think a lot of us are, are, you know, doing things that, you know, may not be our, our dream job may not be the thing that really gets us excited about getting up and going to work in the morning. Well, sometimes you have to do that because you just simply do have to pay the bills. You got to put food on the table. You got to have a roof over your head. You got to have clothes. But are there things you could do even while you're doing that that kind of give you space to breathe and to dream about where are my passions? What are the gifts God has given me? Is there a door that God may be opening for me somewhere? Mm -hmm. and, and then following that and finding the load that has your name on it, the yoke that, that fits you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think doing that's important. Um, but finding that which makes us come alive lets us be in the world differently. Mm -hmm. It lets us be in the world in a way that invites others to breathe. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I use the image, it's uh, one of my favorite images of, of the two oxen pulling a load together and you have a young one paired with an experienced one and, and the young one through the experienced one learns how to breathe together. And when you breathe together, you have greater ability to move your load and to, to move forward and to do things. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think a lot of of this is finding that space, finding the rhythm to breathe, finding mm -hmm. the space to breathe. And mm -hmm. when we do that, life comes in. Mm. I love that. Reminds me of kind of the theory of it's not what you do, it's how you are in the doing. You know, can I, um, sometimes, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a, what would they would call a white collar worker. I spent a lot of time on my computer, you know, Zoom thinking and strategizing and doing presentations, blah, blah, blah. Um, so sometimes when it's like time to like clean the house, <laughs> I'm like, okay, practice Nancy being like joyful and excited about this, <laughs> you know? So even the, the you know, like a, mon a mundane task, I, 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 try, you know, to kind of like, well, how do I be, you know, yeah. how do I be why I'm, you know, on, on my knees cleaning the floors, right? Well, I can be loving and compassionate to myself and grateful for this beautiful home. Absolutely. We all have things that we need to do that would not be the first thing we would choose to do on our free time. Mm -hmm. uh, and even parts of our jobs that you know, may not be what gives us the most life, but need to be done. You know, yeah. I, I don't know anybody who has, you know, doesn't have a part of their job that they'd say, yeah, I really rather I didn't have to do this one piece. Exactly. Exactly. But how can we approach that with a sense of, of gratitude as, as you talk about, but how can we also that approach of, how can we approach that 
keeping in mind that while this may not be what gives us life, it's going to help something down the road. Yeah. It's going to bring life. It's part of a bigger picture. It's part of those seeds like a couple of weeks ago. It's the seeds we plant. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It all is, it all weaves together and you are just so thoughtful and, and, um, and compassionate, um, you know, in your, in your messages. And I'm so grateful that I had had this time with you to ask, ask the, the questions that come to my mind as I listen to your wonderful messages. Is there anything else you'd like to share at this time, Sue? No, I, I, and we've covered so much. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but I hope that, that all who are listening to this uh, get some ideas about how they can find that space to breathe in their own life and how they can ask for help and how they can be there for others. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sue. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. And uh, I look forward to catching Next up again. Time. Okay. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org.